Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning this episode of Turning Tides contains graphic descriptions of racism, rape, murder, violence, suicide, sexual assault, and adult themes. John Siney's speech in Avondale following the massive mining disaster there was more crucial than he could have realized. In the crowd was a young Terence Vincent Powderly, who said, quote, When I listened to John Siney, I could see Christ in his face and hear a new sermon on the mount. Unquote. Previously, Powderly did not concern himself with the plight of his fellow working men. The experiences at Avondale changed him forever. He says, quote, When I saw a mother kneel in silent grief to the cold, still face of her boy to hers, and when I saw her fall lifeless on his dead body, I experienced the sensation that I have never forgotten. I thereby resolved to do my part to improve the conditions of those who worked for a living. Unquote. Several years later, Powderly joined the recently formed Knights of Labor, a union created by the eccentric Uriah H. Stevens. He believed that being a member of the working class was akin to being a crusader for working rights. He incorporated Freemasonry traditions and secret rituals into this new institution. Like its predecessor, the NLU, the Knights believed in mass labor, its ranks were composed of men and women of all races and various skill levels. Even employers were encouraged to join. Powderly found himself quickly ascending in the ranks of the quasi-secret society. In 1878, he became the Grand Master Workman of the Order. Little did he know, within a decade, his moderate and inclusive labor union would be embroiled in the country's first Red Scare accused of a vast, militant, revolutionary conspiracy to kill Chicago's policemen. Powderly did not seem as if he would be a fiery orator and labor organizer. While also being the leader of the union, Powderly was involved in local politics, having won the title of mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania, during the same year he became head of the Knights. Powderly was a firm believer in temperance, and decried alcohol in those who partook. This gave him a holier-than-thou air amongst regular union members, and his strange quirks led to alienation amongst the rank and file of the knights. Many simply refused to listen to Powderly's instructions. In spite of this, the Knights of Labor became the preeminent labor union in the country. They supported cooperatives, nationalizing the railroad, and workers' boycotts but they strangely disavowed striking. Powderly called striking, quote, a relic of barbarism, unquote. Beginning in 1882, however, the Knights were successful in several strikes. In 1885, the Knights took on railroad financier Jay Gould. Powderly met personally with Gould and got the millionaire to agree to recognize the Knights and their right to organize. Gould agreed, as long as Powderly agreed not to strike Gould's railroad again. It was an unprecedented victory for unions in America, and the first time a railroad owner met with a union leader to negotiate. As industrialists across the country grew more and more wary of the union and its secret initiation rituals, the discontent between Powderly and the rest of the union members became too vast. 3,000 Union men went on strike against Gould without Powderly's permission. Gould was promised that this would not happen, so he felt betrayed. He mobilized the state militia and the Pinkertons to protect thousands of imported replacement workers. Powderly was furious at the strikers. He demanded the workers end the futile action, completely undercutting them and their supporters. The strike collapsed and the Knights' record of victory was seriously blemished. 
This came at a time when a rival union was surging across the mills and factories of America. Led by Samuel Gompers, the Federation of Organized Labor Unions championed a single cause, the eight-hour working day. Since the collapse of the NLU, the fight for eight hours had been stagnant. Gompers, a Jewish immigrant whose family was originally from Amsterdam, had very little real schooling, but he was intellectually gifted. Being a cigar maker, intellectualism and the ability to read were highly valued traits. The youngest cigar maker would often read aloud from novels or newspapers as the older cigar makers worked and talked. This is where Gompers first heard the theories of Marx. While he never claimed to be a socialist, he supported many of their ideas. When asked what labor wanted, he responded, quote, What does labor want? It wants the earth and the fullness thereof. Labor wants more schoolhouses and less jail cells, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge, more of the opportunities to cultivate our better natures and to make manhood more noble, womanhood more beautiful, and childhood more happy and bright." Unquote. In the words of Philip Dre, quote, The Federation chose May 1st, 1886, as a fixed date beyond which no American trade unionist would ever again work more than eight hours a day. Der Tag, the day, it was called. Unquote. As anticipation mounted throughout the country, Vincent Powderly half heartedly gave his support for the movement. But nowhere in the country was the movement more volatile than in Chicago. In Chicago, a vocal and growing anarchist movement was bristling for a cause behind which to rally. They were headed largely by German immigrants, but also by the couple Albert and Lucy Parsons. Albert was a former Confederate soldier who fought with his brother throughout the Western theater. Lucy was born Lucia in Virginia in 1851. Her mother was an enslaved woman who was likely raped by her trafficker. Derek Anderson says, quote, In late 1862 or early 1863, Lucia joined thousands whose masters transported or marched their slaves to Texas to escape war and the threat of emancipation, unquote. The young Lucy, her mother, and their trafficker settled in McLennan County, north of Waco, Texas. Following the war, her mother moved them to Waco proper, where the Freedmen's Bureau had created 72 schools, which educated over 4,000 formerly enslaved children. When Lucy was 16, she met her husband-to-be, Albert. He was at this point a radical Republican, who supported the federal government and military reconstruction in the South. This made him highly unpopular in deep North Texas. Following the Civil War, black people in McLennan County faced more violence than in any other part of Texas. While at first enjoying a majority in local elections, more white people from the former Confederacy migrated to North Texas, placing the black community under a state of siege. Following their marriage in 1872, Lucy and Albert had to quickly leave Waco for Chicago. Chicago was in a position of unprecedented growth. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 had devastated the city, but speculators quickly swooped in to buy up the rubble. Massive building projects were undertaken, and the skyline was completely transformed in under a decade. Following the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the socialists and reformists were broken but not shattered. They turned to local politics, where Albert Parsons had run for local office several times unsuccessfully. Lucy, meanwhile, joined her husband in public debates and speeches, becoming one of the most radical of the entire working class. With a candidate in the running for mayor of Chicago, socialists managed to split the vote, leading to the election of Carter Henry Harrison, the first Democratic mayor elected in the city since the Civil War. He would prove to be exceptional at glad-handing and connecting to the citizens he served. He was loved by both the business classes and the working classes. Chicago was a city in which many immigrants settled. 
Harrison clearly understood this, as he knew a solid portion of Czech, German, and Polish. This allowed him to heavily ingratiate himself with his constituents. This also led to him becoming one of the longest-serving mayors in the Windy City's history. Republicans were furious at losing control of the second-largest city in the country. They only recently defeated the People's Party, which was mainly composed of German immigrants. Harrison proved to be shrewd and diplomatic. One of his first subtle coups was offering jobs to high-ranking socialists. Many accepted, causing the most radical to split from the main socialist party. Socialists in Chicago were now divided into two camps, the reformists and the revolutionaries. It was an ingenious move on Harrison's part. Among the revolutionary socialists was August Spies, a German immigrant who recently moved to America following Bismarck's banning of all socialists from Germany. Back in Chicago, the extremists of the socialists were actively arming and training over 500 militia as a means of self-defense. This led to the Illinois Supreme Court banning any such associations. Parsons and spies considered this a breach of their Second Amendment rights, which only further inflamed their rhetoric in the Arbeiter Zeitung and Alarm, the respective German language and English language newspapers they owned and edited. The anti-immigrant feeling in the press were made clear in the conservative papers like the Chicago Tribute. One editorial says of a massive pageant hosted by the socialists, quote, Drain the bohemian socialist slums of the 6th and 7th wards. Scour the Scandinavian dives of the 10th and 14th wards. Cull the choicest thieves from Halstead and the Plains Street. Pick out from 4th Avenue, Jackson Street, Clark Street, and State Street the worst specimens of female depravity. Scatter in all the red-headed, cross-eyed, and frousy servant girls in three divisions of the city and bunch all of these together, and you have a pretty good idea of the crowd that made up last night's gathering." Unquote. In this climate, members of the First International met in London to discuss the recent nihilist bombing attack and assassination of Tsar Alexander II. The London meeting determined that further engagement in reform and democratic elections was useless. These hardliners supported the use of terrorism to instigate change. They called attacks like these an attentat, or propaganda by deed. They inspired dozens of assassinations across the globe, doing more harm than good for working-class movements, as radical politics became synonymous with tumult, disorder, and death. The London meeting has henceforth been called the Black International. Its creation sent ripples of fear throughout the American countryside, where millions of Central and Central Eastern Europeans were living in ghettos and segregated communities. Some of these immigrants were radicals, but an even smaller percentage supported violence as a means to an end. One of them was Johann Most, a fanatical anarchist socialist who advocated the violent overthrow of the state. He was born an illegitimate child to poor parents in Augsburg, Germany. His mother died of cholera, and he lived a Cinderella-like existence under a cruel stepmother. To make matters worse, at age 13, he underwent surgery on his jaw to remove an unseemly blemish, and the surgery was completely botched. It left Most's jaw completely disfigured, alienating him in a world that is extremely cruel to those considered to be disfigured. Discovering socialism in Switzerland, he proceeded to dedicate his life to the cause of liberty. Albert Parsons and the radical Germans of Chicago were swayed by these arguments. Parsons had long admired men like Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, and Patrick Henry. All three openly advocated violence and revolution when faced with tyrannical government. For Parsons, the socialist movement was the next step toward fully liberating America and its working people. However, his feeling toward tradition and ceremony explain how he became a founding member of the Old 400, the Chicago chapter of the Knights of Labor. 
Throughout the 1880s, workers were striking in Chicago for higher wages and shorter hours. However, in Chicago and throughout the country, the Knights of Labor had been failing to protect their striking members. On countless instances, they failed to come to the aid of their men and women, causing their strikes to falter and the union's membership to plummet. In Pittsburgh, some of the most radical Americans in the country met to form the International Working People's Association, or the IWPA. They maintained in their manifesto that, quote, the misery of the wage workers is forced to the extreme. All attempts in the past to reform this monstrous system by peaceable means, such as the ballot, have been futile, unquote. In Chicago, the growth of industry and technology were maligning many working people. Time and again, in the shipping, lumber, and slaughter industries, workers were replaced with machines. Bosses often used machinery to replace the most troublesome union members. Many argued machinery was bringing down wages, while forcing workers into longer workdays. During this time, Samuel Gompers and his federation proposed the May 1st rally. Parsons and spies threw their support behind the movement and galvanized the many workers who read their magazines. Socialism was attracting many immigrant workers from all over Chicago, but especially on the South Side. By 1885, the city was about to explode. Mayor Harrison was the peacemaker who held disparate forces arrayed against one another at bay. In the words of James Green, quote, the first sign of the big trouble to come appeared at the McCormick Reaper Works. Iron molders angrily grumbled over a 10% wage cut young Cyrus McCormick had imposed, even though the company had earned record profits the previous fall. Unquote. Some workers struck, and the GM fired many of the men in the wood department. The call for replacement workers and strike breakers went out. Additionally, Pinkertons arrived in scores armed to the teeth. The first fight erupted at Bridgeport. Pinkertons, armed with Winchester rifles, wounded several Irish immigrants, many of whom were innocent bystanders. In this egregious and cowardly act, Chicago police ended up arresting several of the Pinkerton mercenaries. April 28, 1885, saw a measure of payback for the working class. They ambushed a busload of Pinkertons en route to McCormick's beating the men aboard with clubs and fists. Unarmed, the mercenaries proved less formidable. When McCormick pleaded for more police to help control the strikers, Mayor Harrison refused and told him to settle the dispute with his workers. Head of the slaughterhouse industry in Chicago, Philip Armour, personally intervened and advised McCormick to settle the issue as well. Not even Chicago's business class supported McCormick and his hired thugs. He finally surrendered, and the proposed wage cut was rescinded. Just south of Chicago, close to Lamont, quarry workers felt emboldened enough by recent events to strike. Locals came out in droves to block the importation of strike breakers, causing local authorities to call on the government for the state militia. The governor, Richard Oglesby, reluctantly agreed. On May 4th, quarry workers attempted to confront their replacements. The militia stepped in and fired into the striking workers, killing two and wounding many others. Albert Parsons witnessed the attack firsthand. He said, quote, The shrieks of wounded and dying men filled the air. The warm blood of the people bathed the flagstones of the sidewalks. Unquote. On May 20th, the killing was condemned by a group of social revolutionaries. They vowed to defend themselves and promised to open a, quote, school of chemistry, unquote, which would teach its members how to easily create bombs. Lucy Parsons was maybe the most adamant on seeking vengeance. She called for, quote, a war of extermination, unquote, against the rich. She said, let, quote, every dirty, lousy tramp arm himself with a revolver or a knife, and lay in wait on the steps of the palaces of the rich, and stab or shoot their owners as they come out. Let us devastate the avenues where the wealthy live, as Sheridan devastated the beautiful valley of the Shenandoah. Unquote. 
The streetcar drivers and conductors were next to join the city-wide movement. They struck against the unpopular monopoly which forced them to work for unlivable wages. Carter Henry Harrison agreed at a secret meeting of the business elite of the city on a plan to break the back of the streetcar strike. Leading the efforts to end the insurrection was field commander Captain John Bonfield. Bonfield was a failed businessman, and he carried the same zeal onto the police force. He volunteered to patrol dangerous neighborhoods and instituted the use of corner call boxes, allowing reinforcements to arrive rapidly on the scenes of isolated areas. The use of these call boxes would continue for decades and become incredibly popular with police departments across the country. He single-handedly helped change the image of the Chicago Police Department. Prior to his captaincy, Chicago PD was seen as unreliable by the business classes, as many of its members were Irish and therefore reluctant to break up their countrymen's strikes. Bonfield made a point to align the department with these same business interests, and their dress rehearsal would be against the streetcar strikers. 400 baton and pistol-armed police were a part of this overwhelming strike force. Word passed to the strikers, and they erected barricades along Madison Street. Enraged by the holdup, Bonfield ordered his men into action. The 400 descended like a baton-swinging horde on the citizens and streetcar drivers of Chicago. The captain led the charge, personally beating two construction workers unconscious, one of whom suffered irreversible brain damage. By the end of the night, 150 people were in police custody. The next day was July 4th. The beatings were condemned by socialists across the city. August spies called it a, quote, vicious attack, unquote, and he advised workers to arm themselves in self-defense. The police riot led to Bonfield gaining the apt nickname, the Clubber. As 1885 gave way to 1886, the Windy City braced itself for an especially cold winter. The weather broke as Gompers declared that he and his comrades would strike come May 1st. The city alighted with enthusiasm for the movement at once. While at first disparaging the called-for strike, socialists and anarchists quickly hopped on board the growing momentum and used it to propel their own causes. On May 1, 1886, 350,000 workers struck across the country for the eight-hour working day. Many authorities and newsmen believed this would be the beginning of a lower-class revolution. However, the May 1st demonstrations were largely peaceful. The national strike was so vast and attended by so many workers that one observer called the spectacle Labor Day. The name stuck, and the great upheaval of 1886 paralyzed cities across the country. Chicago was one of the cities hit hardest, due in part to its large, radical immigrant populations. Unionism was sweeping Chicago's industrial yards. One place it managed to penetrate was George Pullman's town. The Knights of Labor were resurgent, gaining 10,000 new members as the year began. In East St. Louis, seven strikers were gunned down by state militia, causing the strike to spread to neighboring cities. Anarchists added their own spin to the eight-hour movement, calling for, quote, eight hours of work for ten hours of pay, unquote. This further inflamed both sides, as the businessmen balked and working men pondered. Violence was avoided all of May 1st and May 2nd. On May 3rd, things changed. First came the shocking news that Powderly's Knights had surrendered to Jay Gould's railroad. Next came the events outside the McCormick's works. Perpetually dealing with worker issues, National Guardsmen and 75 of Bonfield's officers were outside the works, protecting strike breakers and the company's property. August spies had just climbed a wagon to deliver a speech to striking workers when the factory bell clanged for the shift change. The McCormick workers in the crowd rushed forward, throwing rocks at their replacements. These advances were met with state gunfire. August spies claimed to have seen police and militia beating and shooting at the men. In all, six men were shot down by the National Guard and police forces. 
Spies was livid, and he quickly printed the Revenge Circular. In Revenge, Spies says, quote, Your masters sent out their bloodhounds, the police. They killed six of your brothers at McCormick's this afternoon, unquote. Spies goes on to protest against the brutality, hunger, and deprivation which working people are forced to endure. He closes the circular by saying, quote, Destroy the hideous monster that seeks to destroy you. To arms we call you. To arms. Unquote. The socialists met that night and decided to hold a rally the next day on Market Street. May 4th started quietly enough. There were small agitations and marches, but nothing which the police could not control. Business officials, however, remained wary. They asked the governor for the state's militia to be posted on street corners to, quote, enforce order, unquote. The governor, Oglesby, refused. He felt armed troops in Chicago would only inflame the situation on the streets further. Back at the printing house of Arbeiter Zeitung, Spies was approving printed flyers for that night's meeting. He demanded that the line, Working men, arm yourselves and appear in full force, be struck from the flyers, as this would only give the police more reason to disturb their assembly. After a light supper, Spies headed for the Haymarket. Half a block away from the Haymarket, 176 police officers were mobilizing for battle at Captain Bonfield's request. He ordered plainclothes detectives to infiltrate the meeting and report back if speakers became quote-unquote incendiary. At 8.15 p.m., spies arrived at the Haymarket. The turnout was nowhere near what was expected. Only 3,000 odd workers congregated around the square. Seeing the smaller crowd, spies moved the meeting around the corner to the Plain Street. Albert Parsons was not present at the start of the meeting. He'd only just returned to Chicago that day from speaking to striking workers in Cincinnati. He did not approve of the meeting and was against the entire congregation, fearing police violence. Spies began the rally, clearly exhausted from the past few days of organizing, printing, and speaking. He made clear the meeting should be peaceful and that they were there to protest the killings of the day before. Albert Parsons, who arrived with his wife and children, was noticed in the crowd by spies and called forward to speak. Parsons began by citing the vast discontentment with which the working class lived. During his speech, Mayor Harrison was amongst the workers. He wanted them to know he was there, and he wanted to be the first one to know if the speakers were advocating for violence. The mayor walked to the police station during Parsons' speech and told Bonfield the speakers were, quote, tame, unquote. Bonfield agreed and said he would be standing down his men. The mayor returned to the Haymarket to hear Samuel Fielden's speech. He warned of danger and powers arrayed against the working class, and then said, quote, Keep your eye on the law. Throttle it. Kill it. Stop it. Do everything you can to wound it, to impede its progress, unquote. This was considered by plainclothes officers in the crowd to be incendiary enough to inform Bonfield. At this point, Albert Parsons and his family were on their way home, along with Mayor Harrison. The weather changed rapidly, and it began to rain. At 10.20 p.m., only about 500 people remained around the wagon on the Plain Street. Regardless, the police rushed in, revolvers and batons drawn. Captain William Ward, second in command to Bonfield, called out, quote, I command you, in the name of the people of the state of Illinois, to immediately and peaceably disperse, unquote. Fielden protested, quote, but we are peaceable, unquote. After a tense moment, Fielden said, quote, all right, we will go, unquote. Fielden went to step down from the wagon, when something unbelievable happened. A lit dynamite bomb was hurling through the air and into the throngs of the police. Lieutenant J.P. Stanton was a veteran of the Union Navy, and he recognized it right away, saying, quote, Look out, boys, there is a shell, unquote. It exploded the moment it touched the ground with devastating effect, 
wounding at least 30 police officers who were packed around the street. August Spies was still atop the hay wagon, which was being used as an impromptu podium. He took cover after hearing the blast. Spies was under the assumption that the police were firing cannon into those assembled. Then, August Spies says the police began to unload, and, quote, everybody was running and people fell, struck by bullets, right and left, unquote. Many officers rushed past spies, not to apprehend anarchists, but to seek shelter from the storm of friendly fire their co-workers were unknowingly delivering in the smoke-filled street. August and his brother, Henry, were in the middle of this whirlwind. A pistol-armed police officer attempted to kill Henry Spies. Henry grabbed the officer's gun, which was now discharged into his groin instead of his back. But he and August became separated. Albert Parsons was looking out the window of a local socialist bar called Zeph's when he saw the brilliant flash of light created by the dynamite bomb. Moments later, men came rushing into the bar to flee the deluge of gunfire. The two-minute ordeal was over, but America's first Red Scare had just begun. By the end of the week, seven of Chicago's police officers would be dead, alongside several workers killed by police bullets. The police would round up any and all associated with the bombings. Their prime suspects were August Spies and Albert Parsons. The night of the bombing, Lucy argued passionately that her husband should flee the state. Albert refused at first. He did not want his friends and family to suffer the consequences, and regardless, he felt he did nothing wrong. In the end, he agreed with his wife and had to borrow $5 for the train ticket to Geneva, Illinois. Albert left his wife and children, but not before saying, quote, Kiss me, Lucy. We do not know when we will meet again. Unquote. Following the unloading of many a pistol clip into anything that moved at Haymarket Square, the police retreated. There were dozens of wounded, and the cobblestone sidewalks of the near-modern city were slick with human blood and remains. On the worker's side, around 30 people were injured in the quote-unquote battle. One person became comatose for the rest of their life. Three would die in total. The media was ravenous. The anarchists had advocated violence for so long, and now it had come to fruition. The speakers were as guilty as the bomb thrower. The Chicago Times said, quote, Let us whip up these Slavic wolves back to the European dens from which they issue, or in some way exterminate them, unquote. Seemingly, no one supported the socialists who had attempted to meet and protest peacefully. Even labor leaders like Samuel Gompers and Terence Powderly denounced the socialists. The latter said the accused were, quote, a bunch of cowardly murderers, cutthroats and robbers known as anarchists, who sneak through the country like midnight assassins, stirring up the passions of ignorant foreigners, unquote. Within days, Arbeiter Zetung was raided by Chicago PD. The entire staff was arrested alongside August Spies and Michael Schwab, a Bavarian immigrant and romance novel translator. Additionally, the paper's compositor, Adolf Fischer, was arrested, charged with murder, and held incommunicado. Lucy Parsons and Lizzie Holmes were in the process of editing the English-language paper Alarm, when a similar raid occurred in that printing office. After being detained and questioned, Lucy was released from custody, in the hopes her movements would lead the police to Albert. When her husband failed to materialize, she was arrested, and her house was ransacked in front of her children. Albert Parsons was in Waukesha, Wisconsin, where he attempted to lay low with friends in the area. He shaved his signature beard and mustache and stopped dyeing his hair black. Oscar Nieb, assistant manager of the Arbeiter Zeitung, was arrested as well. In his house, a rifle, pistol, sword, and leaflet were discovered, and he was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. May 6th, Samuel Fielden was arrested for speaking last at the Haymarket riot. Fielden was a burly Englishman who had only just escaped with his life from the Haymarket, suffering a bullet wound to his leg. 
he was arraigned with Schwab and spies. This mass crackdown on labor leaders broke the spine of the immigrant socialist movement in Chicago, which had been gaining significant steam. The New York Times wrote, quote, There is hardly an anarchist in the city who does not tremble for fear of a visit from the police. Search warrants are no longer necessary, unquote. New schemes and plots were uncovered by the police every day, and private gun sales soared. The media fed this panic with little to no neutral observations. Even the beloved Mayor Harrison was not spared. He was held partially responsible for even allowing the anarchists to meet at all. At these allegations, he said, quote, Free speech is a jewel, and the American people know it, unquote. He believed that the bomb thrower was a lone lunatic. This was no massive orchestrated conspiracy. Only the small New York City labor publication, John Swinton's paper, was pointing out that if the police had not arrived to forcibly disperse a peaceful gathering, the bomb would not have been thrown at all. Additionally, Swinton stated that the bomb was a, quote, godsend to the enemies of the labor movement. Now, labor unrest equated to violent anarchist unrest, linking the two and tearing down years of respectability the labor movement had gained in the eyes of the public and the middle class. With this comparison in mind, union leaders raced to the center, abandoning many of their radical beliefs about racial and gender solidarity. Forcing the labor movement to turn inward, the bomb thrower did more harm to the labor movement than all the bullets and billy clubs the authorities could muster. May 5, 1886 was the veritable end of reformism in the labor movement in America. There would still be loud marginal voices, but they were continually shut down by union leadership in order to look good for polite society. By May 15, 1886, the eight-hour movement and the strikes with which it was associated were dead, strangled by police intervention. The day before, Louis Ling was arrested by police. While not being present at the Haymarket incident, Ling was a known militant and did make bombs. More than likely, one of his bombs was thrown at police. However, the person suspected of throwing the bomb was not apprehended. The main suspect was Rudolf Schnaubelt, but the only evidence against him is that he fled town after being interrogated. Next to be arrested was George Engel, a toy store owner and a militant anarchist. What had he done? He held a meeting the day previous to the Haymarket bombing with Louis Ling. They threw the 50-year-old immigrant into a sweat box and attempted to coax a confession from him. When this failed, the police put the screws to Adolf Fischer. They told Fischer that Spies had given him up as the bomber. Fischer replied, quote, If Spies has really told you that, then he has lied. Either you lie, or Spies does. That Spies has told an untruth, I do not believe. Therefore, you are the liar. Unquote. Julius Grinnell, Cook County prosecutor, stepped in, saying, quote, a brave man does not lie, unquote. Fisher retorted, quote, Is that so? Then you must be the greatest coward in the world, unquote. Grinnell lost his composure at this and shouted, quote, Then we'll hang you, unquote. Fisher replied, quote, Very well, then hang me, but don't degrade me with any more of your rascally propositions, unquote. It's clear that many of the anarchists refused to cooperate with authorities, but many who were promised financial reward did, and they turned state evidence against their friends. In fact, a mountain of evidence had already been collected against the accused. The authorities planned on railroading the coming trial. Two young defense lawyers and William Perkins Black, a Civil War hero and radical Republican, were set to defend the anarchists. To bolster the team, Black asked his friend William A. Foster to join the defense. Jury selection was a farce. Instead of random selection, a special agent was ordered to collect lists of prospective jurors. In the hundreds of names put forward, only seven men were a part of the working class. 
All the others were upper middle class merchants, traders, investors, and industrialists. One of the prospective jurors was even related to a slain Haymarket officer. The request for a change of location was denied. The trial would take place in the inflamed Chicago area. Only six weeks after the bombing, on June 21st, the trial began in earnest, but not before a sensational moment. Albert Parsons had returned to the city and with a dramatic flourish revealed himself to the courtroom to stand trial with his comrades. Black had convinced Lucy Parsons to get her husband out of hiding, as he was sure the charges would be dropped or at least lessened. The state's case was straightforward. The men accused advocated the violent overthrow of the inherent order and someone acted on their words. It was irrelevant who the bomb thrower was. He need not even stand trial. His physical actions were manufactured by the threatening language of the accused. Black's argument was that this did not equate to murder. This was clearly an attempt by the state to drown out the voices of the people they were oppressing in order to crush the socialist and labor movements in their tracks. The defense team, headed by the two seasoned lawyers, Black and Foster, did an admirable job defending their clients. However, there was simply no way they could have won due to the location of the trial, the jury selected, and the judge who presided over the case. On August 19, 1886, the jury was sent to deliberate. It took them an hour to reach a guilty verdict. Seven of the accused were found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Oscar Neeb was also found guilty, but he was only sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. Black was shocked at the outcome. As the trial progressed, it became clear he could not get acquittals for his clients, but he hoped many of them would receive lesser sentences than death. Albert Parsons stood up and bowed to the audience when the verdict was announced. As one newspaper put it, quote, he had lost none of his Texas nerve, unquote. It was only with the guilty verdict that some mainstream press outlets had begun to come down from their vengeance-filled peaks. They began to ponder the decision and asked more pertinent questions to their readers. Black promised to appeal the decision in front of the Illinois Supreme Court. After six months of deliberating, the court rejected the appeal and stuck by the original ruling. The death sentence was to be carried out on November 11, 1887. Undeterred, Black took the appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States. Support was building for the original Chicago 7. Henry Damaris Lloyd, a popular magazine writer and muckraker journalist, threw his support behind the accused. His father disinherited him over his view. On October 27th, the U.S. Supreme Court heard the appeal of Attorney Black and the renowned Civil War general turned statesman Benjamin F. Butler. They argued that the trial and their clients' arrests violated the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution. Arguing vociferously for the anarchists' cause, Benjamin Butler proclaimed, quote, If men's lives can be taken in this way, better anarchy, better to be without law than with any such law, unquote. Despite their hard-fought appeal, the Supreme Court deemed the constitutional violations of no importance because they only applied in federal cases. Basically, they refused to hear it, arguing they had no jurisdiction. In either case, they said, quote, The defendants had not been deprived of a trial by a fair and impartial jury and had not been denied due process of law, unquote. The lives of the accused now rested in the hands of one man, Governor Richard Oglesby. He was of the old Republican breed and was in the room when President Abraham Lincoln died. By all accounts, he was a fair man and empathized with the accused. But he would not go above legal procedure. James Green says the accused needed to, quote, write statements of contrition. Defense lawyers, family members, and other supporters persuaded Fielden, Schwab, and spies to write such letters, unquote. 
As a result of their letters, Schwab and Fielden had their sentences commuted to life imprisonment. Spy's letter contained a statement that he deplored all violence, even the violence inflicted on workers at McCormick's and in East St. Louis. Additionally, he did not ask for mercy. As a result, the governor did not consider this sufficient enough contrition to be eligible for leniency. Engel, Fisher, Ling, and Parsons all refused to write such letters. In the case of Parsons, the publisher of the Chicago Daily News, Melville E. Stone, attempted to convince Parsons personally. Parsons said to the man, quote, You are responsible for my fate. Your venomous attacks condemned us in advance. I shall die with less fear and less regret than you will feel in living, for my blood is upon your head." Unquote. In spite of all attempts by Black and the many amnesty supporters, Parsons remained adamant. He would not confess, for he could not confess. He had done nothing wrong. Word came from across the globe for amnesty for the accused. The writer, Oscar Wilde, noted Senator Lyman Trumbull, and hundreds of thousands of others signed petitions for the soon to be executed. The voice that was missed most was that of Henry George. A writer and politician, he had championed working causes throughout the post Civil War era, famously writing Progress and Poverty in 1879. He had only just lost the mayorship of New York City in the spring of 1886, splitting the vote between the victorious Democrat, Abram Hewitt and the relatively unknown Republican, Theodore Roosevelt. This probably explains George's reluctance to support the anarchists. Regardless, he was attacked by Roosevelt and lost overwhelmingly in the next year's Secretary of State election, turning the United Labor Party into an afterthought in New York City politics. Maligned by his one-time leftist supporters and conservatives, he faded away into obscurity but his funeral years later would prove to be the largest public funeral in New York City's history, save the procession of Abraham Lincoln's body. Oglesby was overwhelmed by 100,000 signed names on a petition and set about reviewing 8,000 pages of evidence and documents. Meanwhile, Samuel Gompers argued that if the country could pardon Jefferson C. Davis for the rebellion he led, then surely the state of Illinois could pardon seven men for speaking their minds. Arriving to meet personally with the governor was Joseph Buchanan, radical newspaper editor. He requested permission to read two letters written by August Spies and Albert Parsons. Spies asked for a single favor, that he be allowed to die in his comrade's place, writing, quote, If legal murder there must be, let mine suffice, unquote. Buchanan next read a letter from Albert Parsons, who, whilst in confinement, had grown exceedingly bitter. He wrote that if he was being executed for being at the Haymarket that night, then his children and wife should die with him on the platform, since they were there as well. The governor cried out, quote, Oh my God, this is terrible, unquote. As Oglesby deliberated his decision, it was discovered that Lewis Ling had killed himself, a victim of a dynamite capsule which was detonated in his mouth. Many believed his suicide was to prevent the state from killing him. Others theorized the state, in an act of poetic justice, killed Ling. He was, after all, the one accused of manufacturing the bomb, which killed several police officers on May 4th. James Green says the others who were accused, quote, envied him, unquote. Oglesby would not budge from the law. Engel, Fisher, Spies, and Parsons had all failed to give contrition and show mercy for their deeds. Therefore, their sentences must be carried out. On November 10th, close family were allowed to visit the condemned. Engel's daughter, Spies mother, and Adolf Fisher's wife were allowed entry. Lucy Parsons was denied such a meeting with her husband. James Green says she was, quote, reportedly acting deranged, unquote. Well, I, for one, don't blame her. Fed this final bitter pill, Albert Parsons contented himself with the John Greenleaf Whittier poem, The Reformer. It was read to him by his prison guard, whom he came to befriend. 
the poem goes, quote, Whether on the gallows high or in the battle van, the noblest place for a man to die is where he dies, a man, unquote. At this line, Parsons said to his captor, quote, That song will go ringing down the corridors of time, unquote. Parsons said he was happy that he had such a strong wife and children who were too young to miss him too much. The next morning, Parsons wrote to a friend, quote, The guard had just awakened me. I have washed my face and drank a cup of coffee. The doctor asked me if I wanted stimulants. I said no. The dear boys, Engel, Fisher, and Spies, saluted me with firm voices. Well, my dear old comrade, the hour draws near. Caesar kept me awake last night with the noise. The music of the hammer and saw erecting his throne, my scaffold, unquote. In a final gesture of kindness, the sheriff assured Parsons his remains would be sent to Lucy and their children. The jailhouse was guarded like an outpost on the front lines of a war zone. Newspapers kept up the alarmist takes all day, claiming the anarchists were tunneling under the city and prepared to set off dynamite charges before the hangings could commence. With this in mind, none of the families of those about to die were allowed to witness the event. Lucy Parsons desperately attempted to force herself into the gathering. She was arrested, and her and her children would spend the rest of the day being strip-searched for bombs. First to step out, adorned in a long white hood, was August Spies, followed by Fisher, Angle, and finally Parsons. The bailiff quickly threw hoods over the men's heads, seemingly disallowing any final words of the condemned. Spies could not be stifled, however. He had faced an ocean of dangers and declared, quote, The time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. Unquote. George Engel, the old and determined anarchist toy maker, shouted in German, quote, Hooray for anarchy! Unquote. Fischer, the young and powerfully built German immigrant, said, quote, This is the happiest day of my life. Unquote. Parsons was the last to talk. He protested, quote, May I be allowed to speak? Oh, men of America, may I be allowed the privilege of speech at the last moment? Hearken to the voice of the people, unquote. The cord was cut and their traps fell. Stifled in speech to the last, Albert Parsons' body was so frail, it literally swung in place. While Fisher's muscular body twitched like a fish on the end of a line. Angle struggled feebly, while Spies did all he could to hasten his death kicking his knees up to his chin so he could suffocate quicker. Not a single neck broke. Each one of the unjustly accused writhed in agony at the end of their nooses for over seven minutes. The thousands who had worked on appeals and petitions were devastated. The attorney of the men, Black, was particularly beside himself with guilt. It was, after all, his coaxing which brought Albert Parsons out of hiding. Lucy and her children were finally given their clothes back at 3 p.m. that day. When they arrived home, the recently deceased Albert awaited them in a coffin. Lucy was beyond distraught. A doctor on hand was worried she was literally dying of grief. William Dean Howells put the entire saga of the Haymarket well. Quote, this republic has killed five men for their opinions, unquote. Indeed, following the executions, even the hardest-line conservative newspapers seemed to have come to the realization that they were wrong. If anyone instigated violence, it was Chicago's journalists, and they did so ruthlessly. It seemed clear now that perhaps everyone had acted a little too hastily. The shambolic trial would prove a watershed moment for America, as less than a decade later, the men still serving time and the men long dead were vindicated with an official pardon from the new governor, who was elected 
as a reformist. The Haymarket Martyrs Monument would first be erected in 1893. Inscribed on the mantle are the last words of August Spies. The memorial has been targeted by both left- and right-wing vandals, and this had to be refurbished or rebuilt several times throughout its history. The Knights of Labor suffered inadvertently from the Haymarket Affair. Since Parsons was a founding member of the Old 400 of Chicago, the movement was placed in the same sphere with the violent anarchists. Powderly did all he could to combat this image, but it was clear his style of leadership was not needed anymore, and he handed control to James Sovereign. Sovereign continued Powderly's agenda of focusing on industrial cooperatives instead of striking. In the same year as the Haymarket bombing, Samuel Gompers founded the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL. It would prove to have the longest staying power of any of the unions thus far, existing as its own entity until the 1950s, when it joined forces with the Congress of Industrial Organization. Today, the AFL-CIO boasts a membership of over 12 million. The AFL was crucial because it symbolized the clear departure from ideology as a focus in the American labor movement. A spokesperson put it thus, quote, We have no ultimate ends. We are fighting only for immediate objects. We are opposed to theorists. We are practical men. Unquote. This new organization ruffled the feathers of many knights of labor, and a quasi-cold war started between the two unions, each vying for each other's members and influence. Meanwhile, Gompers was a truly ingenious labor leader, winning over 75% of the strikes he initiated through the early 1880s. Always distrustful of politicians, he kept electoral politics in the rearview mirror, instead trying to alleviate problems from within the working system. The industrialists of Chicago believed that they had solved the burgeoning workers' rights movement, but they had no idea they had just become the orchestrators of their own hellscape. Realizing they could get nowhere with aggressive rhetoric, many labor and community leaders turned to nonviolent forms of protest to redress their grievances. This was due to the measured responses many union leaders took in wake of the Haymarket incident. One new development was the mass protest movements against hunger and equality. Poor people were marching to Washington seeking government aid, and other more militant poor citizens were hijacking trains and attempting to drive them to the capital. It was a strange phenomenon, and one which has since been emulated by many protest movements. This protest was fueled in part by a massive depression which rocked the world market in the early 1890s. In New York City, approximately 200,000 people were left unemployed, while 100,000 in Chicago were left in a similar position. Many left home and became vagabonds and beggars, searching for seasonal work or simply a place to sleep. Unlike the previous depressions, the AFL and several other national unions were prepared for the economic crash. They mobilized quickly and dipped into their large strike funds to maintain a portion of their livelihoods. One of these new unions was the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers. For brevity's sake, they will be referred to as the Amalgamation. They stood up to Andrew Carnegie on the banks of the Monongala River, southeast of Pittsburgh, in a tiny town called Homestead. In a bid to make the plant entirely non-union, Carnegie imported hundreds of replacement workers. In response, both amalgamated and non-union workers barred the replacement's entry. The non-union workers in the plant understood that having the union there increased their own wages and working conditions. Losing money every day in which the replacements were shut out, Carnegie surrendered to his workers and signed a three-year contract with the amalgamation. In 1892, these contracts expired, and Carnegie again attempted the same old trick, but added an insidious democratic twist to it. In Philip Dre's words, quote, Carnegie Steel wished to deal with the majority of its workers, those who were unskilled and non-union, rather than the more elite, skilled workers of the amalgamation, unquote. 
In preparation for violence, a ten-foot fence topped with barbed wire was constructed around the plant and cut for rifle holes. The Carnegie Company was seemingly about to go to war with its employees. Carnegie's underling, Henry Clay Frick, announced the decision to terminate all union workers on July 1st. The amalgamation immediately struck against this. They set up watch committees and even patrolled the river by boat. After the workers refused to deal with the local sheriff, Frick called in the Pinkertons. The armed men were ferried in by tugboat. The news spread throughout the town, and the population rapidly mobilized. The citizens begged the Pinkertons aboard to withdraw, saying, quote, We'll not answer for your lives. Unquote. The braggadocious Captain Hind responded, quote, We were sent here to take possession of this property and to guard it for this company. We don't wish to shed blood, but if you men don't withdraw, we will mow every one of you down. Unquote. A striker responded, quote, Before you enter those mills, you will trample over the dead bodies of 3,000 honest working men. Unquote. A tense exchange followed where Captain Hind was barred from exiting the ship at gunpoint. A gunfight inevitably erupted, and the clearly outmatched Pinkertons retreated below deck. The next day, they attempted to land again and delivered accurate fire into the strikers' ranks, killing several and wounding many more. Now, it was war. The people of Homestead mounted a harassing attack on the Pinkertons, who were still inside their boats. Using small skiffs, they would get close to the boat and deliver a withering crossfire. The Pinkertons realized how futile their defense was, and they quickly raised the white flag of surrender, but it was shot to tatters by the enraged townspeople. The Pinkertons were in serious trouble now, as townspeople had started pouring oil and gas into the river in an attempt to set the boat and water around it alight. Union representatives had managed an agreed-to ceasefire. The Pinkertons would surrender their arms and be arrested for the murders which took place over the preceding days. As the terrified Pinkertons came ashore, they were set upon by the town's population. Approximately 300 were roughed up. Many were stabbed and some were even shot. On July 12th, Governor Pattison agreed to send a local militia. 8,000 armed men descended on the small town, and they quickly occupied the Carnegie Steel Works. By early fall, the entire mill was worked by non-union workers. A similar uprising was occurring at the same time in Idaho's plentiful coal beds. In the small town of Cordelin, miners violently resisted the importation of replacement workers. They were led by Big Bill Haywood. As his nickname suggests, Haywood was a massive man, and a huge figure in the workers' movement to come. During this unrest, five people would die, and over 600 miners would be corralled into bullpens, without due process, nor charges filed against them. Inside these bullpens, however, many hundreds of workers laid the foundation for the Western Federation of Miners. Like a hydra, when the labor movement was violently defeated, it sprung up elsewhere with even more fervor, rearing more heads. In New York City, the radical scene was cultivating two lifelong militants, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. They were both anarchists who believed in propaganda by deed. Both were outraged as they read the news of the homestead strikes. Something had to be done. The couple would hatch a scheme to kill Carnegie's underling, Frick. Berkman would commit the crime and become a martyr to the cause. In Berkman's words, quote, The removal of a tyrant is not merely justifiable. It is the highest duty of every true revolutionary. Unquote. He left New York for western Pennsylvania, armed with a handgun and a picture of Frick in his wallet. Once there, he attempted to meet with the steel manager, pretending to be an employing agent of replacement workers. During one of these office visits, Berkman caught a glimpse of Frick and rushed the man, quickly drawing his revolver and shooting Frick in the neck twice before being tackled. Berkman broke free and managed to stab Frick as well, but Frick survived. To make matters worse, even the celebrated anarchist Johann Most repudiated the attack. 
This led to Goldman confronting Most during a speech he was making and striking the man with a horsewhip. In the end, Berkman would receive 21 years in prison for the attempted murder. Additionally, the homestead strike was a blow to the workers of the amalgamation, but it was also a blow to the steel baron, Andrew Carnegie. His reputation as a philanthropist and do-gooder was ruined. Across the country, people were facing an uphill battle against the forces of state and private power. Nowhere was the fight more apparent than amongst black workers. In the 1890s, the black existence went from bleak to nightmarish. Lynchings were the new norm. Every other day, a black man was tortured, beaten, and then hung from a tree. The United States Supreme Court added insult to injury with Plessy v. Ferguson. This case upheld the standards of racist and inhumane Jim Crow laws, while maintaining that black people who were living under segregation were separate but equal. This shambolic ruling is one piece of a long line of proof that throughout this country's history, the highest court in the land has been one of the most corruptible segments of government, and that the justice they deliver is anything but. The horror of black chattel enslavement castigated black workers into mainly agricultural roles, and many industrialists viewed black workers in this context only, and often refused jobs, stating this reason. In the realm of labor relations, Samuel Gompers had failed yet again, where Silvis had failed a generation previously. The AFL did not uniformly support black workers, and many of its local chapters used segregationist rhetoric. This forced black workers into becoming strike breakers against their will, further maligning the workforce with white workers. In 1892, these precedents would be challenged in New Orleans. Here, a walkout of multiracial streetcar drivers terrified the authorities, as differences were put aside to support a 12-hour day. The strike was spreading throughout the entire city. Now many other industries were coming forward demanding a 10-hour day. Authorities immediately resorted to race baiting, warning that the strikes were being taken over by black men. The multiracial coalition held in the face of these racist lies, and they called the general strike across the city. Threats of martial law and local militia intervention ended the strike, but many of the AFL chapters were recognized by employers. This was the first but not the last time that unions would be charged with violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. Originally designed to prevent monopolies, this bill has been overwhelmingly used to target labor unions. As a result of the failed general strike, the AFL abandoned any effort to include black workers, and many local chapters were proud of their, quote, Lily White, unquote, membership. W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the great thinkers of American history, said that, quote, the history of the labor movement from 1886 to 1902, so far as black people are concerned, has been a gradual receding from the righteous declarations of earlier years, unquote. In no way is anti-union sentiment expressed better than by another great American thinker, Booker T. Washington. The Tuskegee educator felt he had no choice but to side with employers over trade and labor unions because their racial policy was unacceptable. He even advocated the use of black people as strike breakers and openly called for their employment, saying that when compared to white unionists, black laborers were, quote, almost a stranger to strife, lockout, and labor wars, and has never been tempted to follow the red flag of anarchy, unquote. The desire of white workers to stick to some form of the status quo passed down by people who merely want to exploit labor and keep a patriarchal white standard intact, has been the crux of the labor movement since its inception. Until this desire is abandoned in exchange for clarity, understanding, and true solidarity, working people would continue to falter in accomplishing their goals for the labor movement. As 1894 began, a series of protests swept the nation. Jacob S. Coxey, 
a quarry owner in Massillian, Ohio, had become fed up with the state of the economy and the lack of action on the government's part. He pledged to march to Washington and confront the federal government directly. He called this a, quote, petition in boots. His co-leader, Carl Brown, was the epitome of the American cowboy, sporting a complex mustache. Coxie, on the other hand, dressed like a country lawyer and was adorned with a suit and tie on the march to Washington. And his three children accompanied him. His eldest daughter dressed in red, white, and blue. His son dressed in a military outfit equal parts Yankee blue and Confederate gray. And his newborn, named Legal Tender, was held aloft at each stop on the march and met with loud cheers. The march began on March 25th, 1894. At first, only a few thousand joined Coxie and Brown on the road, but each town and hamlet they passed attracted the unemployed and agitated citizens of the country. Many newspapers made a mockery of the procession, but then the marchers crossed the Potomac, and fear began to grow. What would happen if Coxie's army entered Washington, D.C.? They claimed to be nonviolent, but the authorities weren't going to take any chances. They arrested the leaders for trespassing, and the march quickly broke up. But numerous other actions of its kind were repeated by other armies of unemployed people. These groups of people departed from cities all across the country, bound for the capital. Most never made it there, breaking up along the way. In Montana, the state's mining industry collapsed with the national economy. 500 Teamsters, under the leadership of William Hogan, hijacked a Northern Pacific freight train in Butte, Montana. The Hoganites met sheriff opposition en route, but repeatedly locals came out to support the hijackers. In Billings, a bystander was killed when Hogan's followers and the U.S. Marshals engaged in a gun battle. They made it through this only to find themselves facing another obstacle. The garrison at the nearby Fort Keogh was called into action, and they barricaded the way just west of Forsyth, Montana. Unwilling to face off with federal troops, the Hoganites surrendered themselves for arrest. They would have been massacred otherwise. Even with all the blows to the labor movement, it still carried on. Starting in the 1870s, an eccentric builder named George Pullman had amassed a huge fortune as the inventor of the Pullman sleeping car, or parlor car. These train cars promised and delivered state-of-the-art luxuries, amenities, and comforts for the time. While at first they were deemed too expensive by critics, they soon became exceedingly popular. Train rides had previously been uncomfortable to the extreme. One could not hope to sleep on the three-day train ride from New York to Chicago. Pullman's cars provided friendly service, refreshments, and clean living. Pullman loved to micromanage his projects, famously moving an entire 20-story building without breaking a single pane of glass. He took the same perfectionist attitude into purchasing acres of public land in Illinois and designing an entire town from scratch. It included a library, church, mail services, and well-ventilated housing. The rent would be higher, and basic necessities would be paid out of pocket by his employees, but they would live a truly luxurious life, in principle. This Ben Shapiro fever dream was a complete catastrophe for those who lived in it, but it was a total win for the landlords and managers. The latter made around 10% profit every month, from all the rent collected. With the failing of the economy in 1893, Pullman drastically cut wages. W.F. Burns contends that, on average, wages were decreased by almost 50% across framing, lumber, and trucking industries in the Pullman town. At the same time, Pullman still delivered dividends to his stockholders that would equal $760 million today. Rents were paid in advance from the workers' paychecks, but of course, rent was not lowered when wages were slashed in half. They remained above average for the area. In addition, he overcharged tenants for water, making nearly a million dollars profit, if you counted it up today. 
These miserable standards led to protests and petitions, which were answered callously by Pullman. He was making do on his end. His workers should stop complaining. They should have saved for this eventuality. George Pullman was, at this point, a multi-millionaire. Adjusted for inflation, he was nearly a billionaire. Funny how the same billionaire mindset never changes. One horrific tale is that of Jenny Curtis, whose father, a 13-year veteran worker of the company, died suddenly. In the days following his death, the company demanded $60 in debt from the dead man's daughter. With the wage reduction, this brought Miss Curtis to the point of near starvation. Something had to be done. Under the leadership of the charismatic Eugene V. Debs, the American Railroad Union was rising to prominence throughout the rail yards of American cities. Made up of all white railroad workers, both skilled and unskilled, what made the ARU special was that its inclusivity was designed to end the usual practice of regional railroad brotherhoods. These brotherhoods made national organizing ineffective, as authorities could focus and wear down one brotherhood at a time. Conversely, the authorities could turn the unions on one another and exploit their regional prejudices. Deb set out to change all of this. Eugene Victor Debs was born in Terry Haupt, Indiana, on November 5th, 1855. His father was a grocer, while his mother was an immigrant who had recently relocated from France's Alsace region. Named after two revolutionary French writers, Eugène Sue and Victor Hugo, Debs was seemingly destined to be involved in radical politics. In his early years, he gravitated toward the writings and declarations of Patrick Henry and John Brown. As a teenager, he organized lectures presented by world-renowned free thinkers like Wendell Phillips and Robert Ingersoll. By his early 20s, he was six foot six. Philip Dre says he was, quote, gangly and stork-like, a Lincoln-esque combination of sinew and brains, hardened by years of physical labor on the railroad, unquote. Starting in 1880, he ascended his local union's ranks, as his brothers quickly realized they had a genius on their hands. At first, Debs shied away from strikes and organized forms of protests, fearing to rock the boat. He originally believed the Union's sole purpose was to care for the sick workers and deceased workers' families. Regardless, he believed in capitalism and was a card-carrying Democrat. During the 1880 Burlington Railroad strike, he came to the conclusion that there must be a national union of railroad workers if they were going to have any hope of enacting change. As if to drive this point home, 1892 saw striking switchmen in Buffalo fail due to infighting within railroad brotherhoods. In 1893, he founded the American Railway Union. Thanks to Debs and his organizational efforts, the ARU grew substantially in its first months. In spring of 1894, the ARU defeated the Great Northern Railroad, surging in popularity because of it. This strike was fascinating because there was no tumult, disorder, or violence. The authorities could not simply crack violent anarchist heads, as they had done in the past. Debs was riding high, and the Union was quickly becoming one of the most powerful in the nation. It had an active membership of 125,000, and it was growing every day. It had penetrated anti-Union bastions, like the Pullman Town in the Deep South. When Pullman's train yard employees came before the ARU convention in June of 1894, they heard of the gouging prices and declining wages, the unfair treatment and the near starvation. The ARU promised to challenge Pullman and the quote-unquote bloodsuckers of the town. At first... They appealed to Pullman and his Christian sensibilities. They asked him to arbitrate with his workers. He flat out refused, and tensions grew and grew between the railroad baron and the union as summer began. 
ARU switchmen agreed to boycott any and all Pullman cars. Other industries vowed to strike in support. James Sovereign of the Knights of Labor said, quote, The sons of toil must stand together, shoulder to shoulder. Unquote. Battle lines were drawn. 125,000 railroad workers vowed to not service any train which contained a Pullman luxury car. Workers in 27 states joined the strike. Several major lines were paralyzed, and Debs was quickly dubbed king by the press. They blamed him for the strike and refused to acknowledge the fact that Pullman was the orchestrator of the entire situation from the jump. The media went to incredible lows to discredit Debs, claiming he was a recovering alcoholic and, according to the New York Times, this led to, quote, the disordered condition of his mind and body, unquote. The federal government sided with the view of Debs as a king. The future president and current judge, William Howard Taft, blamed Debs for, quote, the starvation of the nation, unquote. Authorities in Chicago sought injunctions against the strikers for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act, as well as interfering with the transportation of federal mail. On Debs' part, he understood how sanctimoniously the government would respond if federal mail was held up. He ordered the strikers to service these trains so as not to agitate federal officials. Railroad owners would intentionally place mail cars alongside Pullman cars, forcing the strikers into an impossible position. Inevitably, the federal mail was delayed, causing the government to respond. Illinois Governor John Peter Altgeld would not allow federal troops in his state, citing Article 4 of the Constitution. Altgeld was the reformist who pardoned the Haymarket martyrs and is considered one of the initiators of the progressive era in American politics. Considering the pardons, he said, quote, If I do it, I will be a dead man politically. But by God, if I decide that these men are innocent, I will pardon them if I never hold office for another day. Unquote. Altgeld was something as rare as a four-leaf clover. He was an honest politician. Newspapers railed against the reformist governor and considered him to be on the side of dictator Debs. Altgeld was not bothered by the criticism. He said, quote, Let them pitch in and give me the devil if they want to. They could not cut through my hide in three weeks with an axe. Unquote. Grover Cleveland, quote, the big strong man whom the people have placed in the White House, unquote, was no such reformer, and he detested that the country was shut down because of a handful of disgruntled workers. On July 4th, Federal troops began to arrive, and the constantly volatile population of Chicago roused to meet the invaders in their city. Violence began to erupt once more on the streets between workers and soldiers. Trains were capsized and tracks ripped apart. In response, 2,000, quote, special deputies, unquote, of the U.S. Marshals were sent in as reinforcements. Throughout the 4th, 5th, and 6th, the streets of Chicago were a war zone. Across the country, similar scenes were emulated. Two dozen National Union heads were called together to meet at the Briggs House Hotel in Chicago. They were there to discuss the possibility of starting a general nationwide strike in response to the federal troops arriving. Samuel Gompers opposed the called-for strike. He believed the power of private industry and the government combined was simply too much for the workers of America to overcome, saying that the press, quote, so maliciously misrepresented matters that in the public mind, the working classes are now arrayed in open hostility to federal authority. This position we do not wish to be placed in, unquote. There would be no general strike. The workers of the ARU would have to accept the business-as-usual state of affairs. On July 10th, the strike was officially dead, and Debs had been arrested for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. It would not be the last time he served time for his beliefs.
he attempted to alleviate his parents' fears, writing to them, quote, I would rather a thousand times be a man in prison than a free poltroon. Thousands of the world's best and noblest have occupied prison cells. After all, I shall go into history right. Unquote. Federal troops and private business had banded together in a way like never before to crush the burgeoning labor rights movement across the nation. Time and again, the federal government chose profits over people, as it continues to do today. They resorted to extra-legal maneuverings and threw away the Constitution to deal with labor agitators. George Pullman considered the strike a defining moment for America. It was, but not in the way Pullman meant. For moderate leaders like Gompers, it showed that the time needed to be right to strike and to push for workers' rights. For Eugene Debs, his time in prison convinced him that the capitalist system could not be reformed, and instead it needed to be replaced with a socialist democracy. For Debs, it was either socialism or, quote, wage slavery, unquote. There was no in-between anymore. Today's episode closes where it opened, in the anthracite of eastern Pennsylvania. In Luzerne County, September 10, 1897, a massive strike swept the mines near Hazleton. 400 marched for higher wages and better conditions. They were met by hired Pinkertons who demanded that the strikers turn back and not take another step forward. Some strikers stepped forward, and the Pinkertons opened fire. At least 19 mostly Slavic, unarmed mine workers were killed. Almost all of them were shot in the back. Their crime? Stepping forward to protest. The Pullman strike did fail, but started a modern labor movement, which would not simply be snuffed out. In total, upwards of 70 people died across the country during the federal troops' intervention. The ARU would fail as well, but other unions would take their place. Eugene Debs would step away from the labor scene and become the country's preeminent socialist politician. In the coming years, he would seriously threaten the established order and gain millions of adherents in America's working-class communities. Years later, Eugene Debs would write a short story called The Old Umbrella Mender about a former ARU striker. The following is an excerpt from his writing. Quote, I was walking briskly toward my office. A stiff wind was blowing and drizzling rain was falling. The threads in one of the ribs of my umbrella snapped asunder and the cover flew upward. I was about to lower my disabled shower stick when I ran slapdash into an old itinerant umbrella mender with his outfit slung across his back. He had noticed the ill behavior of my umbrella. It snapped from its bearing even as he had his eyes upon it. Perhaps it understood. He was about sixty-five, his clothes evidently weathered many a storm. Besides being worn and shabby, were too light for that season. Overcoat, he had none. Nor gloves, nor overshoes. Mine embarrassed me. The outfit of the old fellow, carried on his back, was sorry enough to fit his general makeup, and if he had offered himself for sale just as he stood, including his earthly belongings and his immortal soul, he would not have found no bitter, nor brought a cent. He began to sew the cover back into its proper place. His fingers were red and numb. A discolored nail partly hid a badly bruised thumb. He had difficulty in doing this bit of sewing, and it plainly distressed him. Poor human soul! I thought to myself, a vagabond dog among his kind would fare better than this worn-out old umbrella mender in a civilized human community. The warm clothes I had on made me uncomfortable, as I saw him sitting there in rags. 
the overcoat I wore made me ashamed of myself. Every time the umbrella mender looked up out of his rags, I winced. What crime had he committed that condemned him to go through the world in tatters to be lashed by the merciless blasts of winter and tormented by hunger pangs? Dared I call him brother? And could I call him brother without insulting him? Good morning, was the cheery greeting of a man who passed on the sidewalk, calling me by name. The old umbrella mender fairly started at the mention of my name. Excuse me, he said timidly. Is this Mr. Debs? Yes, I answered. Thank God. He fairly bounded to his feet. There were tears in his eyes, and his face was flushed. Say, Jean, he continued, I am pretty well down, ain't I? about all in and making my last stand before shuffling off. But say, Jean, I never scabbed. Look at these hands. I'm an old rail, and I followed the business for 27 years. If I'd been like some of them, I'd had a passenger train years ago and been saved a lot of grief. But I'd rather be a broken-down old umbrella fixer without a friend than be a scab and worth a million. Did you belong to the ARU? I asked. Did I? he answered. I was the first man in our division to sign the list. My card, I lost it in Ohio where I was running as a vagabond. I raised a row about it and they threatened to lock me up again. Did I belong to the ARU? Well, I should say I did, and I am proud of it. When I cross the big divide, I can walk straight up to the bar of judgment and look God in the face without a flicker. We had the railroads whipped to a standstill, he said warming up. But the soldiers, the courts, and the army of deputy United States marshals that scabbed our jobs were too much for us. And then he told me the melancholy story of his own persecution and suffering after the strike. His job was gone and his name was on the blacklist. Five jobs he secured under assumed names were lost to him as soon as he was found out poverty, began to harass him. He suffered much, but he had kept the faith, and his regrets were at least free from reproach. He was a broken-down old veteran of the industrial army. He had paid the penalties of his protest against privately owned industry and the slavery of his class. And now, in his old age, he was shuffling along in his rags toward a nameless grove in the potter's field. Had he scabbed on his fellow workers? Had he been mean and selfish and cold-blooded, he would have been promoted instead of blacklisted. His right to work and live, his home, his family, and his friends were all swept away because he refused to scab on his fellow men. The old umbrella mender stood before me proud and erect and looked me straight in the eyes as he finished his pathetic story. The shabby clothes he wore were to him capitalist society's reward of manhood and badge of honor. His shabbiness was all on the outside and he seemed transfigured to me and clad in garments of glory. He loomed before me like a forest monarch. The tempests had riven and denuded of its foliage, but could not lay low. Unquote. The labor movement in America was laid low right before the 20th century began. But just like the Umbrella Mender, the movement survived in spite of the violence and power arrayed against it. The world was entering a new century and was about to experience new problems. Global war would interrupt the entire labor movement, and workers would kill each other in the millions on the battlefields of Western and Eastern Europe. In America, days-long battles would become months-long conflicts, 
as miners across the nation took up arms to protest their inhumane treatment, leading to one of the most horrifying massacres in American history. Women and children would be corralled into a pit and burned to death by federal soldiers who would go on to face zero legal consequences for their actions. To hear the story of Ludlow and the Colorado coal mine wars, you'll have to tune in for the next episode of Turning Tides. The story of American labor during the 1880s and 1890s is a story of oppression. It was a definitive period of growth for unions, with new national organizations which were too large to defeat simply through state-sponsored violence. Unions learned their power lay in their popularity amongst the lower and middle classes. Labor organizers who failed to build support in these places could not hope to be successful in prolonged strike actions. Additionally, the use of antitrust laws to charge labor agitators created a dangerous precedent for the future of labor relations. Until next time, I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to like, share, and review on your favorite podcasting app. Have a great day, and don't scab. If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support, and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.